So in the remainder of this recording, we're going to finish up talking about some gram-positive cocci-shaped bacteria that are catalase negative. Uh, we started with the Streptococcus genus, but we've got a few more Streptococcus bacteria to still talk about. And then we're going to get through the Enterococcus and a whole bunch of gram-positive bacilli bacteria. So we finished up with the Streptococcus pyogenines, but again, there are more Streptococcus bacteria out there. So Streptococcus pyogenines was one of the group A Streptococcus bacteria, which means it had A antigens on its surface, and it's just one way we try to sort out all the Streptococcus bacteria that are out, we, that are out there using the different antigens on their surface. Again, we can't visually see the different antigens, but just like we can't see the antigens on your red blood cells that make you type A or type B, they have A antigens on them, they have B antigens on them, and then some don't have any of them. Uh, so our next group of antigen streptococcus bacteria is called group B streptococcus bacteria. And really there's one main group B streptococcus bacteria that affects humans, it's streptococcus agalacti. When we gram stain it, it's gram positive. They like to hang out in chains. Uh, we just distinguish it from our other group A strep is just that it has different antigens on them. On a blood auger plate, generally group B strep has, still does beta hemolysis, just like group A. However, the zone around the colonies is a little bit smaller. It's a little bit harder to see that full breakdown. Also, strep B bacteria are resistant to bacitracin, whereas strep pyogenines, a group A, is sensitive to bacitracin. It's one way we can distinguish it in the lab. Now, Streptococcus agalacti is not an extremely common bacteria. Most of the time we see this particular bacteria causing issues with newborns. And so a lot of the diseases are usually diagnosed as neonatal diseases. This particular bacteria uh, can get in the bloodstream, cause bacteremia, can get in the cerebral spinal fluid and cause meningitis, and it can get into the lungs and cause pneumonia. It usually affects about every three births out of every thousand. Um, so it's not extremely common, but that's still a decent number where it can cause a lot of complications. Uh, it can also affect and cause issues with older immunocompromised patients, as most things can. To diagnose this particular bacteria, we generally do an ELISA test. Uh, it's completely treatable. Penicillin, ampicillin are generally the top antibiotics that are given. The easiest prevention is because this is a bacteria that's picked up from mom. This bacteria for a lot of females is part of their normal flora and their reproductive tract. And during childbirth, the infants pick it up. And so a lot of, this is the one bacteria that during, uh, during pregnancy, they test mom to see if they're a carrier of this particular bacteria. And if they are, mom is given penicillin during or right before childbirth so that the bacteria is gone before childbirth so the infant doesn't pick it up. So it's just one way we control infants not picking it up is by treating mom before childbirth. Now again, there's lots of Streptococcus bacteria out there, ones that have A antigens on them, ones that have B antigens on them, ones that have a whole bunch of other antigens that affect other animals. Uh, but there's still a group of Streptococcus bacteria that don't have any of those particular antigens. So I like to call them kind of the misfit group, uh, so, but it's commonly called, it's the viridins group. These are all alpha hemolytic Streptococcus bacteria. So on a blood auger plate, they're gonna have kind of a greenish pigment to it. A lot of normal oral flora. Your normal flora in your mouth is alpha hemolytic strep. And so even when you guys did the throat swabs, a lot of times you saw a lot of that alpha hemolysis. That was very likely some type of alpha hemolytic strep bacteria. However, they can cause disease um, and they can cause issues, usually in older immunocompromised patients. And these are some of the bacteria that if they grow and you don't brush them off, uh, they feed off what you eat and they can cause cavities and they can cause your dental plaque. If they get into the bloodstream, like when you don't floss very often, uh, and when you go to the dentist and they're poking around, if you've got bleeding, you have an open wound, and this is a bacteria that can get in there and into the bloodstream, and it can cause serious issues. Now, generally, it only causes serious if you, issues if you are immunocompromised. 
And so it is one reason why highly immunocompromised patients are many times put on antibiotics before a dental visit, just because of that high risk of having those open wounds and the chance of putting some of this bacteria into those open wounds. Now, one bacteria that is in the viridin group, it's not generally part of your normal flora. Uh, it is a Streptococcus pneumoniae. It's one of the bacteria we work with in our lab. And when we gram stain it, it's gram positive. It's cocci, it's part of its name. And they usually like to hang out in pairs or really short chains. So pairs is a big one, but they'll hang out in shorter chains as well. Again, it is alpha hemolytic and it's part of the viridins group. It doesn't have those A or B antigens on them. Now it does have a lot of virulence factors that allow it to <coughs> cause disease. Its biggest virulence factor, which is why I have the little asterisks on there, is that, that it does have a capsule. And again, it likes to hang out in pairs. Couple other virulence factors, it does have an adhesion protein that allows it to stick to the epithelial cells in our pharynx. It makes its own enzyme called secretory IgA protease that it actually breaks down our antibody, our immunoglobulin A. So when our immune system tries to attack it, this bacteria produces an enzyme that starts to attack our, our antibodies. And then it also makes an, an enzyme called pneumolysin that breaks apart or lyses epithelial cells. It allows this bacteria that entry into the body if it can break apart our first line of defense. Now, if it gets in, Yes, based on its name, it can cause pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is very much a condition more than a disease. If we just say someone has pneumonia, uh, it becomes difficult because there's lots of things that can cause pneumonia. Um, bacteria can cause pneumonia, fungus, viruses, lots of things can cause pneumonia. And so if we know that this particular bacteria is causing pneumonia, we call it pneumococcal pneumonia because it's caused by a coxal shaped bacteria and on my specifically the pneumonia and so we say it's pneumococcal pneumonia. It's pneumonia caused by the streptococcus pneumonia. Now those that are at highest risk, the usual group, elderly immunocompromised and infants are going to suffer the highest or worst side effects. But although the word pneumonia is in its name, it's not the only thing it can cause. It depends where the bacteria gets. It can cause sinus infections, it can cause ear infections, it can cause bloodstream infections, it can cause heart inflammation, and if it gets into the cerebral spinal fluid, it can cause pneumococcal meningitis. Now my little note, just like pneumonia is kind of a generic uh, disorder more than a disease, meningitis is the same. Lots of things can cause meningitis when we know specifically what causes it. We've got to you know, give that information. It's pneumococcal meningitis. Now it is one of the meningitis because lots of things that can cause meningitis that if left untreated, it is a very deadly meningitis. So we're going to want to diagnose people if they are showing any particular symptoms. Uh, they usually gram stain a sputum sample. They'll grow it out. They'll look for that alpha hemolysis. They're going to look for its sensitivity to the antibiotic optogen because most other alpha hemolytic strep are going to be resistant to this bacteria or this antibiotic. They're also going to look to see if it's sensitive to bile. This particular bacteria, if you put it in bile in a lab, it will dissolve unlike the next group of bacteria that we talk about that looks very similar in the lab. Treatment and penicillin is generally our top treatment, erythromycin if that's not working. But our biggest prevention, we do have a, a vaccine for this particular bacteria. It's usually highly encouraged for elderly individuals and those that live in close quarters with others, such as those that live in the dorms. They usually try to promote this particular uh, vaccine. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the next group of bacteria we've got, they're still gram positive cocci, they're still catalase negative. <coughs> it's the enterococcus group. Now, anything that has enter or entero in its name has something to do with the intestines. And so these are intestinally found bacteria, still cocci shaped, still catalase negative. But as you've got two groups of bacteria that are both gram-positive cocci and catalase negative, uh, there are going to be some lab tests to figure out which is which. 
Now, again, when we gram stain them, they're gram positive. They also like to hang out in short chains or pairs, just like the, the uh, Streptococcus, especially that Streptococcus pneumoniae. Out of all the Enterococcus bacteria that are out there, there are really only two species that actually cause human disease, the Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus facium. They're found in the human colon, hence their name entero, and they're just fine, part of the normal flora. However, if they get introduced somewhere else is when they now cause an opportunistic infection. Examples, if they get into an open wound, you know, have a wound infection. If they get into the urinary tract, which isn't too far away, it's a top cause of urinary tract infections. Now, Enterococcus bacteria are a top or, a, you know, a big cause of healthcare associated infections or nosocomial infections. About 10% of healthcare associated infections are caused by this particular bacteria, the Enterococcus. And it's kind of crazy as we get into a lot of gram-negative bacteria, how many fecal-driven bacteria are top causes of healthcare-associated infections. Just leaving you with that. Now, what do we want to diagnose? Because this bacteria and that Streptococcus pneumoniae look very much alike in the lab. One way to diagnose it is they look again at that sensitive sensitivity to bile. This particular bacteria will not dissolve in bile, unlike the Streptococcus pneumoniae. This bacteria, it's found in the intestines. That's where bile is found. So it's evolved to be around bile, so it's not affected by bile. Treatment is getting a little more difficult because it is becoming resistant to a lot of antibiotics that we have out there. We do still, still have some that work, but it's becoming more and more difficult every year to find antibiotics that are effective. Prevention becomes difficult because for a lot of individuals, this is part of their normal flora, so we can't get rid of the bacteria altogether. Our best bet is to minimize transmission, and the best way to do that is good hygiene. And on my proper aseptic techniques, wearing PPE, and on my gets all the proper precautions to minimize that transmission to someone else. Now, on to a completely different shape. Our gram-positive bacilli, our gram-positive rods, and we divide them up into whether they have an endospore or not. So we've got two genus of bacteria that do make endospores, the bacillus and the clostridium. So we're gonna start with those. So our first group, the bacillus, when we gram stain it, yes, it is gram positive. They are bacilli shaped. The whole genus tells you what shape they are. And they do make the endospores. Now, generally bacillus usually like to hang out in really long chains. And there are a lot of normal bacilli out there. There's a lot of environmental bacilli. Um, say, Mike, depending on what you guys have swabbed and done in the past and decided to identify, um, you may have seen some of these nice, long, chaining bacilli organisms. Lots of bacilli out there. There's really only one main bacilli that causes some significant human disease, and that's bacillus anthracis. And again, it's not the bacteria that causes the issues. It's the toxin that the bacteria makes that causes all the issues. Now, there are three ways to pick up this particular organism. And this particular bacteria is found mostly in animals, uh, as well as in soil, because it comes from fecal matter from those animals. And so a couple ways we pick them up. One, you could ingest the spores, rare. They could get in through broken skin, more common, uh, or you can inhale the spores, also rare. So depending on how you pick it up depends on what kind of anthrax disease you have. If you ingested the spores, which is rare, I think there's one, maybe two cases a year in the United States, so it's extremely rare. You have gastrointestinal anthrax. Uh, it can be very deadly. Those that's left untreated, about 50% die of it. Even with treating, your survival rate really only goes up to about 60%. So luckily only one, maybe two cases a year occur in the United States. Extremely rare bacteria. Uh, the more common way to pick it up is that if you're working in soil or dirt that's contaminated with the bacteria, is that it gets into open wounds and it can cause eschars. These are blackened ulcers on the skin. Again, it's still rare, but out of the three ways, it is the more common way. Uh, again, it's 
treats definitely treatable. We have lots of antibiotics that can treat it and most recover without any long lasting infection for, with cutaneous anthrax. Uh, the third way to pick it up is if you inhaled some of the spores. Also extremely rare, but because this particular toxin can destroy cells um, and cause damage to cells, it can damage the lungs and it can be deadly. This is normally the bacteria that you hear about with bioterrorism that, you know, oh, you can inhale anthrax. It is. It is a very deadly bacteria because of the toxin it makes and how it can destroy the lung tissue. However, it's extremely treatable if you know you've been exposed to it. So diagnosing it, they're going to culture it, they're going to grow it up, usually from a skin scraping or a lung or sputum sample. They're going to look for the bacillus, those nice long chains in the endospore. But it's treatable. We have lots of antibiotics that work, just even your basic penicillin. It's just you need to get treated before the symptoms occur uh, for your best survival rate. Otherwise, prevention, we can try to control the bacterial disease in animals, which are the main carriers of the bacteria. And we do have a vaccine that is available if someone knows that they're going to be at a higher risk of picking up this particular bacteria. Now, of the other genus of bacteria that can make endospores is the clostridium. And there's a lot more clostridium that causes human disease than bacillus. So when we gram stain them, they do have endospores. Uh, they don't like to hang out in chains. And anything in the clostridium genus, they are all anaerobic. They all need to get into parts of the body where, where they don't have any oxygen. And so when we grow and culture them in labs, we also have to put them into an anaerobic environment. Now, because there are so many Clostridium bacteria that affect humans, there's lots of places that we find the bacteria and lots of ways that we can pick it up. Uh, we can find Clostridium in soil, we can find it in water, we can find it in the digestive tract of both animals and humans. So lots of places that Clostridium hang out. And so lots of different opportunities for us to pick up different Clostridium bacteria. They do also all make digestive enzymes lipases to break down lipids and proteases to break down proteins. That allows these bacteria to feed on our tissue because they can break down lipids and proteins and use our lipids and proteins as their own energy source. Now, our first clostridium that can affect you is Clostridium perfringens and it's the toxin that causes all the issues. It causes irreversible damage to the body. Now, Mike, it's extremely damaging wherever this bacteria goes it's extremely damaging now there's two ways we can pick it up you can ingest food that has this bacteria in it or the bacteria can get into an open wound and underneath the skin into that anaerobic environment now if you ingest the food you have food if you ingest the bacteria in your food you have food poisoning you're going to get your basic cramps, you're going to have diarrhea generally within about 24 hours after ingesting the bacteria and the toxins. Um, usually no fever because it's not the bacteria that's causing the issues, it's the toxin that's causing the issues. If it gets into open wound, as in this picture, this bacteria, as it breaks down all those lipids and breaks down all the proteins, it is destroying that tissue that's gangrene. Now as it breaks down the tissues, uh, using those enzymes, it does release a very foul smelling gas. So if you've known anyone, because sometimes I do have students that have worked with patients that have suffered from this particular bacteria, it's a very smelly bacteria as it breaks down our own tissues. Uh, and so that's called gas gangrene because of that very noxious smelly gas. Now, now my, this bacteria can spread really quickly if it's an infection as in that picture if left untreated and I'm like it can spread far enough cause enough damage that it can kill within a week of infection now diagnosing that needs to be quickly so sometimes if they think it's a food poisoning case they're going to look for the bacteria in the food and they're not looking for just one or two bacteria you can survive eating a couple of bacteria they're looking for high quantities of bacteria in the food or they're looking for high quantities of bacteria in your fecal matter if they grow it up on a plate a blood auger plate they're going to look for a double zone of hemolysis most bacteria just show you know beta hemolysis and it's just all clearing this particular bacteria although it does beta hemolysis 
almost has this outer kind of reddish tinge to it that's unique to this bacteria that it has kind of two colors to the hemolysis on a blood auger plate. Now treatment for food poisoning, the bacteria leaves with the diarrhea. So the treatment for food poisoning is to let the diarrhea happen, replace fluids and electrolytes. If it's the gas gangrene, as in this picture, they're gonna have to surgically remove the dead tissue, they're gonna do a debridement, and they're gonna give you lots of antibiotics to kill any bacteria that are still there. Best way is to not get it, refrigerate the foods properly, so if any bacteria are in the food, uh, they are not reproducing, uh, and make sure wounds are cleaned properly so you don't get those bacteria into those open wounds and into that anaerobic environment. Now, out of the four Clostridium that we are going to talk about, the top four that cause human disease, they're not the only four, uh, most are familiar with this particular organism, the Clostridium difficile. Now, my little note about Clostridium, because uh, you'll start to see it on various things, there are a lot of Clostridium bacteria. We're just gonna go over the top four that cause human disease. Because there are so many Clostridium bacteria, they are trying to subdivide them and sort them. And so as they've been doing this in the last year, they've realized that Clostridium difficile fits into the subgroup of Peptoclostridium. And so they wanted to rename it Peptoclostridium difficile problem with that. We just went from calling this by its common nickname C. diff and when we shared it called it Peptoclostridium then we would now have to call it P. diff. The money that it would cost the healthcare system to change everything from C. diff to P. diff uh, was too much so they petitioned to not rename it Peptoclostridium and instead it's now called Clostridioids difficile. So they are renaming this particular genus, this particular bacteria, to Clostridioides difficile, just so we can call it C. diff instead of P. diff. So, although your book says Clostridium, I still call it Clostridium, you're going to start to see the word Clostridioides uh, come up more often. Same bacteria, they're just, there's so many Clostridium, they're trying to kind of sort them out. Now, this particular bacteria for a lot of individuals is part of their normal intestinal flora, and it's kept in check by your other normal flora in your intestines. However, it becomes an opportunistic pathogen, a disease-causing organism, when you change your normal flora. And that usually happens when you take those broad-spectrum antibiotics, you kill most of your normal flora, but this is an endospore bacteria, it's not gonna die as easily, and so it starts to grow uncontrolled. It can cause a minor infection all the way to explosive diarrhea. That's the words of your textbook. Now, the toxin that this bacteria makes damages the colon wall, and it causes the cells of the colon to slough off and cause ulcers and inflammation of the colon wall. So that's all of this red tissue is the sloughing off and the ulcers in the colon. That's your pseudomembranous colitis, that's inflammation of the colon. Now, this is also another top nosocomial or healthcare associated infective bacteria. And it's not because it's picked up when you're in the healthcare setting. Instead, it's because you're given antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics while in the healthcare setting, which throws off your normal flora, causing this particular bacteria to grow uncontrolled. Now, when we diagnose it, they can look for the bacteria from your fecal matter, they can look for the toxins itself, or they can do PCR, which is looking for the DNA for the bacteria. The top treatment for this bacteria is to stop taking antibiotics. Normally, most, you know, most treatments for bacterial infection, the first treatment is to start taking antibiotics. Instead, the treatment for this is to stop that. And again, we want your normal flora to come back. Another treatment is uh, they can prescribe metronidazole, and usually a high dose. It's a high dose, um, high, I was gonna say, it's got a lot of side effects. It's a really strong antibiotic. So it's usually only given for very serious cases. Um, but what they are noticing just in the last couple of years, again, not in your textbook yet, uh, is that fecal transplants work really well. Normal flora bacteria in your intestines keeps this particular bacteria in check. 
when you kill them all, it grows uncontrolled. So if you can take fecal matter from someone else and recolonize your normal flora, it works amazing. They are having amazing results. People that were on their deathbed because of this bacteria, one fecal transplant and they're getting released from the hospital within a week. I mean, it's crazy amazing. Um, it sounds horrible, uh, but it works great. Now, best prevention, good hygiene so that if you don't have this bacteria as part of the normal flora, you don't pick it up. And if you are in a broad spectrum antibiotic, try to take some probiotics to try to keep your normal flora around as much as possible to keep these bacteria in check. The third clostridium is clostridium botulinum. Again, it's the toxin that causes the the issue. And so it's when you ingest the toxin, those botulism toxins, you run into all the issues. Now, my little refresher in anatomy and physiology, you spend like, I don't know, an hour, two hours talking about how skeletal muscles contract. This is my 30 second review of that. So here's your skeletal muscle. We know it's a skeletal muscle. It's striated. It has lots of nuclei on the outside. You have an axon, an axon terminal. Now, when an action potential, which I know you wish you'd never heard the word action potential again, but when an action potential from your neuron travels down and to the axon terminal itself, we'll zoom in here, here's your action potential, it causes acetylcholine to leave the axon terminal, cross the synaptic cleft, bind to some receptors, on your skeletal muscle. It will cause the moving of various ions, generally calcium, and your skeletal muscle contracts. That's your basic how a skeletal muscle contracts. However, this particular toxin will coat the end of your axon terminals. So even if you have an action potential telling your skeletal muscle to contract, because acetylcholine can't leave and tell the skeletal muscle to contract, your skeletal muscle will not contract. That becomes an issue. You have a really important skeletal muscle, your diaphragm, that needs to contract. If your skeletal muscle, if your diaphragm cannot contract, you don't breathe and it ultimately leads to death. Now, there are three ways that we generally suffer from this particular bacteria. One is called foodborne botulism, and that's if you ingest a large quantity of this toxin. Not the bacteria, but if you ingest a lot of the toxin that this bacteria made. Now, that usually happens from improperly canned foods. This is a clostridium bacteria, an endospore-making bacteria, which means it can survive some normal canning processes. And as if it survived, it's going to grow and reproduce and produce these toxins. Now, I generally say don't ever open and definitely don't eat any kind of bulging can. If it's bulging, it's because something's growing in there. Now, if you ingested this particular toxin, some of the initial symptoms that you're going to have, usually within about a day or two after eating those suspicious peaches, you're usually going to have blurred vision, dilated pupils, constipation, um, and abdominal pain. Now, Again, if still left untreated, if you don't go in, um, it can be deadly within a week of infection. Again, it depends how much you ingested, uh, but it's deadly. Another way you can pick it up, it's called infant botulism, is if um, infants ingest the bacteria itself. So they're not ingesting large quantities, then we consider it foodborne botulism, but if they actually ingest the bacteria. You as healthy adults can ingest some of this bacteria. Your immune system would recognize it and get rid of it. Infants, which don't have strong immune systems, their immune systems wouldn't recognize the bacteria and this bacteria would reproduce in their body, producing those toxins. It's gonna lead to the same symptoms. Problem is, you can't always know. You don't know if they have blurry vision. You don't know if they have constipation, except they might have abdominal, you know, or they might be in pain or crying more often. Um, but it is deadly because a lot of times it goes undiagnosed for longer periods of time. 
then third way to pick up this particular bacteria is if you get the bacteria in open wounds. This bacteria can be in soil samples. Um, and so I'm like, it's rare that it's picked up this way, but endospores, the bacteria could get into open wounds. You're gonna have all the same symptoms as foodborne botulism. It usually just takes a couple extra days for that to happen. And so I'm like, either way, it's, it's, all, it's all bad. We don't want your skeletal muscles to stop contracting. Now, diagnosing it, a lot of times they're going to look for the symptoms, as was described on the last one, that blurry vision, dilated pupils, constipation. Um, a lot of times you may have um, difficulty breathing. Again, your skeletal muscle, your diaphragm might not be working correctly. That's usually later symptoms. Treatment, they're going to try to give you antibodies to try to bind up or neutralize the botulism toxin. They're also going to give you antibiotics to try to kill any bacteria that might be in your body as well. Now, your best bet is your best scenario is to not get it in the first place. Proper food canning. Now, my note, it is an endospore bacteria. Um, if any of you can foods at home, there's two ways you can do it. You can boil can it and you can pressure can it. Uh, boil canning the 100 degrees Celsius will not kill this bacteria. However, if the food is acidic, the combination of 100 degrees Celsius plus acid will kill this bacteria. It's why when you can foods, if you have fruits which have natural acid in them, you can boil can them because the acid plus boiling will kill it. However, if you are canning uh, alkaline things, things that don't have acid, like various types of vegetables or meat, because it doesn't have the acid, you have to pressure cook it. You have to pressure can it. You have to get that temperature up using the pressure. Um, it, but it's another reason why a lot of times it'll even have you add acid or lemon juice. And I'm like, to still increase your chance of killing this particular bacteria. They also recommend not giving, inf not giving honey to infants up to the age of one. So if you look at home, I think you're probably there when you're listening to this. Uh, if you've got any honey at home, you should be able to look at the back of the container and it says do not give to infants under the age of one. It's because honey in itself does contain, uh, not always, but it can contain Clostridium botulinum. It can withstand the antibacterial properties of honey. And again, you guys can eat honey, you can eat a few bacteria. Infants can't ingest any of this bacteria because your immune system's not going to get rid of it. Now, one little interesting point I have on here, my little random factoid that I've got a little Botox clip on here. If you ever wondered what Botox stood for, if you drew a line right between the O and the T, Botox stands for two words. It stands for botulism toxin. When you are given a Botox injection, you are actually injecting the botulism toxin underneath your skin. The botulism toxin's job is to stop muscle contraction. Number one reason why your, uh, your wrinkles show up is your skeletal muscles of your face are contracting. They are flexing and moving your skin of your face. If your facial muscles can't contract, your wrinkles will not be as evident. And so my, my random little factoid that yes, you are injecting, injecting the botulism toxin. Also why when you listen to commercials, the when they go really fast through all the possible side effects, one of them is difficulty breathing. It's because although the toxin should stay put where they inject it, it could get into the bloodstream and it could cause issues with your diaphragm. So I'm like, listen for that the next time you listen uh, to a Botox commercial. The fourth Clostridium is Clostridium tetani. Again, it's the toxin that causes all the issues, the tetanus toxin. And it works almost opposite that the botulinum toxin works. So the botulism toxin causes your muscles to not contract. The tetanus toxin causes your muscles to not relax, which means your skeletal muscle will contract and it will stay in a contracted state. Again, that's a huge issue. Your diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. And if it stays in a contracted state, you can't breathe properly, which means it's deadly. Now, diagnosing it, generally the first muscles that seem to uh, be affected are muscles in the face. And so it causes what we call is lockjaw, is that the muscles in your face stay in a continually contracted state. 
you literally can't open your mouth. The only reason your mouth opens is that you relax the muscles in your face. And I'm like, well, this makes it that you cannot rem relax the muscles in your face. Um, treatment, and I'm like, usually, again, we've got to get bind up that toxin, so they're going to give you antibodies against the tetanus toxin. They'll try to give you antibiotics to kill the bacteria that's in the body, and they may also try to still active, you know, do an active immunization as well to try to stimulate the body to make its own antibodies faster. Now, the biggest prevention is we have a vaccine. It's the T in Tdap or DTAP. Um, and my note, everyone's like, oh, how do you pick up the bacteria? You get it from a rusty nail. Well, kind of. Uh, this particular bacteria is found in soil. It's found in dirt. And it has to get into an open wound. It has to get into that anaerobic environment because it's a clostridium. And so it's true. If you get cut by something rusty, well, you now have an open wound. Um, and two, anything that's rusty generally means it's outside and is probably dirty. So any of that soil, that contaminated soil, could be on that surface that now just has an open wound into the body. However, you actually have a more likelihood of picking up this particular bacteria if you have any open wounds on your hand then you're a gardener. If you're in the dirt with open wounds, you have a higher chance of picking it up than when you get cut by something rusty because this bacteria is found in soil. Totally preventable though. Get vaccinated and keep updated with the vaccine. Now, our last, last group is our gram-positive bacilli or rods that don't make endospores. And there's four genus that we're gonna talk about. The first one is Listeria. When we gram stain it, these guys are a coxobacilli shape. So they're super short. So they're almost cocci shaped. They're almost round, but not quite. Uh, we generally pick it up by eating or drinking contaminated foods or beverages. This bacteria will actually grow just fine in a cold environment. Most bacteria are inhibited when you put them in a refrigerator or a freezer. This bacteria will still continue to grow. Uh, this bacteria, when you do ingest it or drink it, will actually cause cells of the body to eat it or ingest it. So macrophages, which are big eating cells, cells of the liver, cells of the gallbladder will actually start to ingest this particular bacteria. Here's an actual picture of it. Uh, but this bacteria does not get broken down. Once it's been eaten, it's figured out a way that it doesn't get broken down and it stays inside of our cells. It hides inside of there and it starts to destroy the cells that it infects. Now, its big virulence factor that allow it to cause disease is the fact that it is an intracellular organism. It hides out in our own cells. The only way our body can get rid of this bacteria is to kill our own infected cells, which is never good either. Now, healthy individuals can, you know, pick up this bacteria and generally not suffer any more than some mild food poisoning symptoms, some diarrhea or vomiting. However, this bacteria can cause a very deadly meningitis in fetuses and, in, and immunocompromised individuals. So elderly, um, anyone that's sick, uh, it's, you know, like it causes... A lot of issues. It can. It's deadly in immunocompromised and elderly individuals, and it is a, one of the bacteria that can cross that placental barrier, and then cause um, issues with fetuses. So anytime there's a listeria recall, and I swear when I talk about these different bacteria, we start to see recalls in the news. Uh, they're usually concerned just about pregnant women and elderly and immunocompromised, healthy individuals. It's very rare that you would suffer any serious complications, um, but it can be deadly for others. Now, when we diagnose for this particular bacteria, they will grow it up to help ID it, but it is a bacteria. It does have flagella on it. It is a modal bacteria, and because it just has a flagella on one end, it likes to spin around or flip around and do what's called tumbling motility. It's treatable, but the sooner you get treatment, the better, because if you wait too long, uh, the bacteria will do too much damage to the body that it's deadly. Uh, we do have lots of antibiotics that work, lots of them that are effective, but the sooner the you get treated, the better off you are. Uh, if you do fall into that immunocompromised elderly or pregnant uh, group, they usually want you to avoid certain foods that are at higher risk. 
uh, Brussels sprouts, raw milk, so anything that's been un that's not been pasteurized, soft spreadable cheeses like brie, smoked seafood, and various deli meats and hot dogs um, are all high risk for containing this particular bacteria. The next genus that's in our gram-positive rods that don't make endospores are mycoplasmas. Uh, they're the smallest of our gram-positive bacteria. They're free-living, which means they can survive out in the environment. They are also pleomorphic. They can't make their own peptidoglycan. So when we gram stain them, they actually look gram-negative, but they are genetically gram-positive. They're tricky to grow. They usually require various growth factors in the lab to even grow them up. Uh, for a lot of individuals, they're found and cause issues in the mucous membranes of both the respiratory tract and the urinary tract, causing pneumonia in the respiratory tract and causing UTIs in the urinary tract. But the most famous mycoplasma that causes issues is mycoplasma pneumoniae that yes, can cause pneumonia, but it causes a really mild pneumonia. And so we call it walking pneumonia. Because for a lot of times, if you're diagnosed with pneumonia, you're in the hospital, you're extremely sick. This one is you're walking around just fine. You can go to work, you can go about your day. It's very mild symptoms. We also call it atypical pneumonia because that's not normal. So it has atypical symptoms. There's no white blood cell response. Generally, if you have a bacterial infection, your white blood cell count is gonna go up because they're trying to fight off the bacteria. This one would not affect your white blood cell count, and it's a very mild disease. Uh, it's spread by nasal secretions, and kids between the ages of 5 and 15 are at the highest risk. That doesn't mean kids younger than that. Um, our adults can't pick it up, and they're just the highest at risk. I usually just like to think it's because kids are dirty. Uh, and I'm like, they're the highest num you know, age group for cases. When we diagnose it, we usually do an ELISA. We don't usually grow it up on a lab because it is so picky to grow up, um, and it can take weeks to grow up to even study it. So as where we grow stuff in the incubator, it's 24 hours, we've got enough bacteria. This would take several weeks to grow up. So we usually do an ELISA test. Prevention, because it's spread by nasal secretions, good hygiene, proper hand washing is the easiest way to prevent yourself from picking up this bacteria. And the next group of our gram-positive rods is the Carini bacterium. Now, when we gram stain them, they're pleomorphic. They are rods, but some of them can be long rods, some of them can be short rods. Uh, a lot of them are part of your normal oral flora or even your skin. When we did throat cultures, you might have even identified your throat bacteria as a Carini bacterium. Lots of normal flora. However, there is one main Carini bacterium that causes human disease, and it's the Carini bacterium diphtheriae, which causes the disease diphtheria. Now again, it's the toxin that causes the issues, not the bacteria, and it blocks various enzymes for working. We need, we need enzymes to do everything. Um, it can also cause some of our fluid and white blood cells to congregate and kind of group up uh, and they form this big, huge growth at the back of the throat called a pseudomembrane. Now, that pseudomembrane can get large enough that it can actually block airways and cause suffocation and death. Um, but because of that big pseudomembrane, it is one of the biggest diagnostic tools is being able to see that pseudomembrane form. So when we do a diagnosis, you're looking for the pseudomembrane but we can also grow it up. We do have a very selective media, specialized media that grows just this bacteria. Um, so easy to diagnose if you have growth on that particular plate. Treatment, they're gonna give you antibodies to neutralize the toxin, uh, penicillin, erythromycin to try to kill the bacteria, and they might need to surgically remove that pseudomembrane so that you don't have um, any airway blockage. Again, it's preventable. It's the diphtheria toxoid vaccine. It's the D in DTaP. Um, so I'm like, it's rare. There's not a lot of cases of this bacteria out there anymore since we've developed a vaccine. We used to have hundreds of thousands of cases of this bacteria every year. Because of vaccinations, we're down to generally um, 15 to 20 a year tops. So yay for immunization. And then our last, last group of gram-positive bacilli is our mycobacterium. 
So they are gram positive, but because they have that lipid, the mycolic acid in their cell walls, uh, these are ones that we would have to acid fast stain them to help do a proper diagnosis. Now, a couple unique characteristics is that they are slow to grow. So just like that myco, uh, just like the, um, the corine bacterium and the mycoplasma, I'm like they're all kind of slow to grow. Again, it takes a little extra to make that mycolic acid. Uh, they also can be phagocytized or eaten, but then they don't get broken down. So they can grow intracellular, and they're showing a lot of resistance to various types of antimicrobial drugs. They can also show resistance, and they're harder to kill. Uh, they can resist drying out. They can resist various chemicals, various disinfectants. They're harder to kill. Now, although there are about 75 species of mycobacterium out there, there's really only three that affect humans, so they're going to be the next three we talk about. And the first one is the most common, most commonly heard of mycobacterium, the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, it causes a pulmonary disease. Again, where the number of cases that we have here in the United States, it's going down. Uh, but, and I'm like, we still have a lot of individuals out there uh, that are spreading it without knowing they carry the bacteria. There are three types or kind of stages of infection, primary, secondary, and disseminated. And I'm going to go over those on my next slide with the picture. So I'm going to say this is showing some of the white growth of this bacteria in the lung tissue. So primary infection. So it's a bacteria that can get eaten and then it doesn't break down. It's intracellular. And so when you start to get a lot of cells that are infected with this particular bacteria, they start to congregate together and stick together. And in the lung tissue, it's all those infected cells that are sticking together that we call as a tubercle. That's where we get the tuberculosis. Now, that's primary infection. Now, as some of these initial cells start to die off, that's your Cassius necrosis, this tubercle will start to rupture. And I'm like, it's, you know, the cells are starting to die. And those infected cells are going to release their bacteria into other areas in the lung. That's when we have secondary or reactivated tuberculosis. It's still affecting just the lung, but it's now spreading. Now, the disseminated tuberculosis, so primary is just those initial tubercles fall, forming, secondary reactivated, it's spreading to other areas of the lungs, and disseminated is this bacteria gets into your bloodstream, so it's going to travel outside of the lungs. Top areas that this bacteria does like to target, it likes to target the spleen, the kidneys, and the brain, and it can be extremely deadly. Now, to diagnose it, one, you could look for that acid fast bacteria when you do an acid fast stain. You can um, culture the organism out and look at it underneath the microscope. We can uh, look for the DNA. Uh, we can also do the skin test. Most of you have probably already had a TB test done and yours did not probably look like that. It identifies those that have been exposed to the particular bacteria. They might also do a CHEX x-ray to actually look for those tubercles forming, those congregation of infected cells that are forming. Now, treatment's difficult. The antibiotics, um, it's usually a combination of antibiotics and you're given it for months, not weeks. Normal antibiotics, it's 10 to 14 days. This is three to six months um, that you're on antibiotics and sometimes a, a group of them. Uh, I'm going to probably not say their names correctly. And these are the top antibiotics that are usually given or prescribed. Uh, if you think you're at high, uh, in a high risk position, we do have a vaccine. Uh, it's the BCG, it's named for Bacillus, Calmet, Gearin. It's, you know, named for the two or the two guys that developed the vaccine. But because it, it's spread usually by coughing and secretions, uh, you can wear a face mask to also slow down or, you know, so that you don't inhale those droplets from an infected individual. Our next mycobacterium, not very common, uh, especially compared to tuberculosis, but it's mycobacterium leprae, which causes the disease leprosy. This particular bacteria grows best at around 30 degrees Celsius. Most of the bacteria that infect us like 37 degrees Celsius. This one likes 30 degrees Celsius. 
and so it likes the cooler regions of the bodies. So your extremities, your nose, your fingertips, the cooler areas that aren't at quite at that 37 degrees Celsius. Um, armadillos are the only animal that actually has a body temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, and so we can actually, uh, I am going to say grow this bacteria in armadillos, but you can actually pick up this particular bacteria from armadillos. So a lot of armadillos carry this bacteria. So if you're ever around armadillos or go anywhere where there's am wild armadillos, leave them alone because <laughs> this is a bacteria that you could pick up from them. They are a natural known carrier of the bacteria. It's a rare bacteria though, and I don't know how much contact you have with armadillos. Uh, it's usually transmitted person to person, nasal secretions, otherwise if it gets into open wounds. So if you've got open wounds and you're hanging out with armadillos, um, you could pick it up. Uh, it's treatable, but just like the mycobacterium tuberculosis, it's a mycobacterium. It's hard to kill. It's going to be a combination of antibiotics for months instead of weeks. And then our last mycobacterium, our last gram-positive bacteria is mycobacterium avium intracellular, intracellular, also called mycobacterium avium complex. Um, this is the top mycobacterium in, that affects AIDS patients, so highly immunocompromised individuals. It's usually picked up from ingesting or eating contaminated foods or beverage. In this bacteria, it's an it's intracellular, it's based, I mean, it's in its name, and I'm like, and it's all the bright pink. This, these are macrophages, these are cells that are there to eat bacteria and then break down, break them down. This bacteria gets into cells and not just macrophages. It can potentially get in any cell in the body and it grows uncontrolled. These cells are completely taken over by this bacteria. It's why there's so much pink uh, and it's why uh, it kills the cells ultimately. Depending on where you have a high concentration of this bacteria, it can lead to total organ failure. Um, treatment's beginning more difficult. It's normally a trial and error with antibiotics. Again, it's a mycobacterium. You're on antibiotics for months on different combinations, and if you're already immunocompromised, um, you're probably on an antibiotic for the rest of your life, um, but it is a really deadly bacteria for AIDS patients. Now, there's the end of this lecture, so you should be good now to be able to uh, take the, the, the next online quiz.